Good morning, I'm Meredith Ross, and we start the day with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who became the first Prime Minister to appear before the Supreme Court in an attempt to persuade it to reject submissions aimed to stop the government's controversial plan for Israel's natural gas. Netanyahu gave a speech in court stressing the importance of the outline, but was not cross-examined nor asked a single question. This highly irregular move from Netanyahu comes after a year of such steps, including firing ministers and regulators who opposed his outline and warned it creates Israel's biggest monopoly ever, handing out the country's largest natural treasure to the local oil uh, tycoon Yitzhak Tshuva and the American gas conglomerate Noble Energy. Everything seems set for the removal of the last hurdle facing Netanyahu on his way to pass the outline, but in a surprise move, the Supreme Court suggested the government will legislate the stability clause, a clause barring future Israeli governments from regulating the gas monopoly for at least 10 years. And now with gas prices dropping at an all-time low, is this the final nail in Israel's gas outline coffin, or will Netanyahu keep on pushing it regardless of resistance? With me in studio today are various experts to debate this ongoing battle including Boaz Arad, manager of the Ayn Rand Institute in Israel. Good morning to Good you, morning. Boaz. Amir Foster, a consultant for gas companies. Good morning, Good Amir. Morning. Ariella Berger from the Israeli Institute of Economic Planning and Research. Thank you very much for joining us. And researcher Amnon Portugali from the Hazan Center at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. Thank you very much for being here as well. But before we get brawling, let's watch the following report and we'll take it from there. This agreement will bring in hundreds of billions of shekels to Israeli citizens over the coming years. Earlier this week, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu became the first sitting Israeli leader to personally appear before the country's Supreme Court. He came to defend a contentious natural gas deal. Netanyahu told the five justice panel, we are in the 19th last minute in terms of our ability to realize the potential of the state of Israel's gas. Every additional delay could lead to grave results and it is doubtful if we could recover from them. Israel has been trying to extract offshore gas since the discovery of the Tamar and Leviathan fields in 2009 and 2010. Currently, only the Tamar field west of the port of Haifa is in production, but the far larger Leviathan, estimated at 18.9 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, has been hit by a series of delays. <laughs> Critics say the deal between the Israeli government and a consortium, including U.S. firm Noble Energy, pushed forward by Netanyahu, overly favors the firms involved. They argue that depending on a single consortium of backers carries the risk of a monopoly. On December 17th, Netanyahu signed a new deal with the companies, having agreed to sell some of their other assets as part of the accord, despite the SPAC being in fact a violation of their previous agreements with the state. The gas that will flow into Israel will be used to help decrease the cost of living, because gas is a significantly cheaper energy means than other energies. Supreme Court approval of the Leviathan deal would allow the consortium to move forward on contracts for gas sales, including intent to export the gas to other countries in the region, which could grant Israel strategic leverage. So, Ariel, uh, we'll begin with you this right. morning. Uh, it was the first time a prime minister appeared in Supreme Court yes. to testify for any sort of legislation. Uh, so, so, so just talk about the significance of that and, and what happened yesterday. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the significance goes back, actually, to around December last year, when the oil price first went down. And that's when the first unusual events happened, um, starting with the events that led to the antitrust commissioner standing down and the pushing forward of this framework agreement. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister standing in front of the Supreme Court, I think it's correct what you're saying, it's highly unusual. I, I should emphasize, I think he was also standing both as Prime Minister and both as Minister of the Economy. And it also follows his appearance at the Knesset, at, excuse me, the Knesset Economics Committee uh, at the end of last year. Um, all showing that the government is very strongly supporting this framework agreement, but it's a very controversial agreement for the Israeli consumer and for the industry as a whole, I'd say. Very unusual. Mm -hmm. And uh, Amir, just break down why it's so controversial uh, mm -hmm. for people who aren't so familiar with the issue. Okay, it's a bit because that um, we have 
only one uh, player today in Israel. It's Tamar uh, Gazuzev, right. Tamar's partnership. And uh, the owners of Tamar and the owners of Leviathan is the other big Gazuzev that we have are mostly the same owner. So a lot of uh, um, the, the protest or mm -hmm. uh, the people in the public say it's monopoly, so uh, we want it to break it. But um, the condition in the market in Israel today is quite good. The tax is high, and actually in the, in the, in the outline there is some kind of uh, price control. So mm -hmm. the prices can't really have big changes, uh, both sizes actually. Mm -hmm. So um, the monopoly don't have the power of uh, re a real monopoly. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on what you said, mm. I don't think it's so much that the public thinks that there's a monopoly. I think the controversy was more that the antitrust commissioner, who's the regulator whose uh, reason of being is protect the public interest, mm -hmm. um, already said that there was a suspicion of a monopoly and then came out with a decision that it's a monopoly and the monopoly causes harm to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Because the monopolies in themselves aren't illegal. It's when they con cause consumer harm. Mm -hmm. So the decision that he came out with, I think you'll agree with me, this is actually, um, it, it's more that the, the antitrust commissioner said that there's a monopoly yeah. rather than the public. Yeah. And that's really what's causing the problem, you see, because the gas price is falling mm -hmm. globally and the outline fixes the gas price really quite relatively high. It's not, it's and not, it's it's not the outline, the it's, it's, the contract, it's the contract that um, the that more partnership have with the electricity company. It's not the outline that's making the prices. Well, the, the price prices mechanism wasn't set before the outline. It was open. It could have been a regulated price mm. or it could have been mm. a market-defined price. So I, I think it's because it, it, the outline... It was regulated by the, um, by, by, uh, the electricity authority. We need to remember the final that the electricity was authority uh, wanted that the prices will... <laughs> Uh, linked it to 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 may, may give a uh, general uh, view on yes, it because well, like getting into all well. the detail yeah. I think mix a lot of people. Okay. Uh, first of all, I like to quote uh, Judge Robert Borok that mm -hmm. says about the Israeli legal system uh, that uh, the Israeli s Israelis have less and less reason to go to election and choose their elected government since everything is decided on high court, mm -hmm. and uh, this is part of the Israeli uh, judicial activism which we see right now in action. Uh, we have to remember that the elected government choose a certain decisions. I don't agree with these decisions. I think that there is a deep misunderstanding in regard to monopolies and uh, in regard to resource in Israel. First of all, the idea that monopoly is hurting the public is never uh, applied to the public market. We have a huge monopoly, and the gas is not the bigger monopoly. We have a huge monopoly in agriculture, in uh, electricity, we have a, a, a government-owned company, uh, we have it in water, we have in every, almost every resource and infrastructure, we have a huge monopoly, which is and Israeli citizens are suffering from the inefficiencies of these monopolies and nobody make a peeps on, on it mm -hmm. but when we have a possibility for a private owned monopoly then we see mainly left-leaning organization jumping with crying and crying out that this is outrage mm -hmm. and basically as I see it I see it as a, as a political battle on the on the free market in Israel, of course and, it's uh, and I believe that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, that believe in free market, trying to move the country toward the freer market, and what we see is the backlash that went up to the Supreme Court after falling in the Knesset. And I do want to get a, an idea of the scale of this project, uh, Amnon. What do you talk about developing a gas field? What exactly does that entail, and how much money are we talking about? Well, Tamar costs around three and a half billion dollars to develop all together. Leviathan probably today will be in the order of $4 billion. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems to me that there is no economic justification to develop Leviathan. There is no market for the gas. And you don't believe that trade and, and exports is necessarily possible as well, correct? No, it's not possible in the current prices unless Israel will sell gas or the gas companies will sell the gas at around anywhere between two to two and a half 
on the wellhead. This is part While of the While Israel problem. pays about four, Israel, Israel Electric Company pays about five and a half. And so it's a huge it. discrepancy, mm -hmm. and I don't think the public would like to see it. But I think the major point that. here is not this dissertation about the Israeli market or etc. With all due respect, it's the stability clause which the Supreme Court said about. And this is, in my opinion, is the most important in a negative way in the gas framework. And because it's balatantly anti-democratic. Hmm. You cannot have regulation security. It's, detriment it's against democracy. Is we this want is the Van Leer's institution position? It's not my, it's my position. It's your private position. It's my uh, position. private okay. position. Van Just has, to make it clear. Van Leer has no position in the gas business. Good to hear. It's my personal opinion. It's not only mine. It's the opinion of the major uh, professor of uh, legal studies in the universities. And they wrote about that. it. Some of them, you cannot, some of them don't. It's you argument. cannot have stability because government cannot bind itself cannot bind even, certainly cannot bind the next government, and certainly cannot bind the Knesset. Even the Knesset, the Knesset cannot bind the next Knesset, etc. So government... Of course the Knesset can change it. No, no well, that's not security. After 10 years. If you take no. your, upon yourself, if it, the government take upon yourself not to change the laws, which means it circumvents the Knesset mean? ability to change it. And this is unlawful. Yeah, it's undemocratic. We have to remember it's the essence that of democracy. We, we, have want to, to we have to remember that we need to respect contract. And Israel showed a track record of breaking every so contract. I think, I think it's important every to agreement. Every, clause, every I'd country like to come in. changed the tax law. Possibly, but, but we are not the in the a position to be able to But not in a way. Once in two or three years. No, let's, in the let's, last 15 right, years. Let's, let's, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, just, because I'm just aware that this is. For people who are interested in oil and gas, this sounds very exciting, but maybe to viewers it's, it's not really understood. So just in terms of what was on at the High Court, there were basically four aspects that walked for the High Court. There was export, the legality of evoking Clause 52, the sufficient redundancy in the system, and stability. Now, what is it about this stability clause? I was actually reading last month, there was a paper put out by uh, the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, which is affiliated with Oxford University in the UK talking about these fiscal stability clauses and explaining two things. One is uh, stability clauses are something the gas companies like for obvious reasons. Yeah. It means they don't need to worry about things changing. But it does tend to be something that only developing countries have. Mm. Because exactly. so, and it, that, the rules are I haven't changing. finished, Amir, just one moment. So the second, okay. that's the first point. I mean, Israel, we love to see ourselves as we are a developed country, an OECD country, so it's actually right. quite unusual. The second point is just to, uh, just to give a little bit of insight as to why it's con so controversial in the, at, the, uh, at the High Court. You see, the argument is that if you have a stability clause, first of all, it's strange for Israel's profile and it's not good for the country. And the second point is that if things change in the future, there'll be another government or circumstances change, then actually the states as a country would have legal exposure because it would come under international law. Whereas if it goes through the Knesset, the legal claim is, then as a law, if there was any dispute in the future, it wouldn't go to the international court. And th that's my understanding of legalities. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, so maybe someone will call in and correct me. But that is, why, that, that is why the judges, which that, this is the unusual move in the High Court, in the Supreme Court, they actually asked the government if they'd like to reconsider bringing it to legislation. So I think that's why the stability clause um, is so controversial. But there are, of course, other things to do with redundancy in the system and mm -hmm the exports and how Clause 52 was invoked, there were also part of, there were a few petitions that came up it, in the Supreme Court. It's really, it, it's really uh, not a lot of people know that the stability clause is dealing with three major significant uh, changes that the government has already done just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all is the fiscal conditions that change in the Shishinsky Committee and the export courts that change in uh, a so. Tzemach Committee and market structure that already just have been uh, yeah, the, 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 the government deal with just now. So I don't want to live in a country that changing the rules all the times because because companies won't come here. Yes, but there's so, no okay. contradiction to uh, saying yeah. that. 
and to the suggestion of it going to the Knesset. Sorry, and uh, so you know, I just like also just go I'd on, like, go on. one thing I'd like to point out, which is also very interesting. Uh, it's a strategic point in this report. It says a fiscal regime established when oil prices were fifty dollars per barrel may well be viewed when prices stand at one hundred dollars per barrel as simply being too generous to the industry. So you see, the oil price things change mm -hmm. in the industry, and this mm -hmm. report explains. I'm from the UK. It explains how the UK multiple times. And the UK is very you, you, free market. In yeah, fact, the UK that's... Parliament, you can see that but, they but, but claim you... it has the most free market mechanism for gas trading in the world. And yet, the UK changes the regime. So, so the fiscal most, regime. Most, so most, the most, of the time, yeah. most of the time, when oil prices are uh, down, going yes. down, uh, the regime, if it's changing, it's changing to, 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 to a point that uh, the regime reduces the tax. In, in, in low oil prices. When so you said that maybe we need to reduce the... Yes. No, Tax I said today. that when, when the oil price is down, the gas, if you're looking at the position of the gas companies, the gas companies are in a weaker position. Mm -hmm. I mean, you came from a financial background, right, yeah. from the financial markets. Mm -hmm. Noble Energy, uh, you know, most of its the assets from the US, US mm -hmm. and in Israel, Mm -hmm. uh, when the oil price goes down, it's not good for the oil companies. So it's very understandable from the oil companies' point of view, or the gas companies' point of view, why they would want a stability clause. I think uh, the reason it went to the Supreme yeah. Court they want is the question clause, as to whether it's good for the country. It's good for the oil prices, because the way the government the Israeli really regulation deals with gas. Yeah. The, yeah, the Israeli not, regulation need to set a, a track, and this is also something that mentioned the state controller in his report, that the regulation regime in Israel need to be... Uh, to be fixed and this is part of the trying of the government to fix it and I hope that we will get into the track to a free market in the future. Well I think that is a good okay. point to end on. Unfortunately we have run out of time but thank you all very much for being here this thank morning. We could obviously much. debate this all day uh, well into sunset if we yeah. were to stay yeah. here. Thank you all so much for coming this morning. Thank